Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Legally, where the legal meets the cultural with our two resident experts, Royce Russell Esquire and Pachata Esquire. My name is Dr. Stacey N.C. Grant. Welcome back to another week filled with news. We want to thank all of you that have been tuning in. You've been sharing it with your audience. You've been engaging and giving your commentary on all that we've been covering it's not ironic, I think it's all divine timing that we've been talking about issues that show up in real time in the news and you have two people who do this for a living daily that are advocating for our rights, helping us understand the legal and the cultural so that we can get justice where we can. So let me let my co-host say hello. We'll start with Elver Pichado Esquire. Hello, hola, buena tarde. Um, what the weather and other circumstances prevented me from participating in last week's show, but I'm happy to be back and 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 here. And, and so I thank you for listening today. And I hope you find, as usual, I hope you find our show uh, fulfilling and educational. Thank you so much, Evan. Uh, Buenos dias to all of our listeners as well. <laughs> Hey, Deborah, thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you being here. Over to you, Mr. Royce Russell S. Well, you know, I don't want to date myself, but if we had Welcome Back, we could play that Welcome Back Carter show. Welcome Take you back on the stage, you know what I mean? <laughs> Welcome back, brother. Glad to see you here. Glad to see you were able to weather the storm. And, uh, you know, Dr. Grant, I just want to let our viewers know that we're going to talk about voting. And we've been talking about voting and what it means to vote throughout our whole show. So, you know, we're going to do a little reading because reading is necessary in understanding what we're doing. And we're going to hit the road and get it going. Absolutely. So there's a lot of things that are in the news right now. We know that a lot of our community, we're definitely sounding the alarm on what it means to utilize the opportunity to vote. Right. That is important. And hello, Nathan. Thank you for joining in. We appreciate you being here. Hey, Richard. So let's get into it. There's some breaking news that is happening um, in Florida regarding voting and our community. So I'll turn it over to you gentlemen to help us understand what we're actually seeing in real time when it comes to felons being able to vote. Well, I mean, we definitely want to talk about that, but just Ed, if you don't mind, if, we, if I can uh, pin that just for a second to give us some little groundwork on it, because oftentimes, Dr. Grant, you know, we'll start a subject matter and you're like, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let's go back. Let's make sure the audience understands what's going on. So in the heeds of understanding how you like to proceed, we're going to do exactly that. So, you know, Ed, and you're going to talk about this as we go on, you know, Florida, there's always been issues in Florida and, you know, there's issues about voting and it's never going to change. But before we get to that, I just want to have our audience understand that, you know, for the first time listeners and for those that have never participated in the vote, don't know, you know, what it's all about. I mean, how could you not know what it's about, but don't know how to register? You'd be surprised. There are people here that don't know how to register to vote. And therefore, you know, they don't take it seriously or their lives are so complex and they're looking at the day to day that they can't even see themselves participating in something that is national. So, you know, for all our, all our listeners that are already and viewers already know, you have to be a US citizen in order to vote. You have to be a resident in the state for which you're voting in for at least 30 days. Or you, if you are in college and you live somewhere else, then obviously you can do an absentee ballot and you're not a resident of that state because you're there for a particular purpose. You have to be 18 years of age. And as Dr. Grant talked about in New York, which we'll talk about, and then we'll zoom to Florida, 
You can't be in jail and you can't be on parole. Now, ain't that something? You can't be in jail and you can't be on parole. So now, in my head, as soon as I think of jail and I think about this legislation, my brain takes me to more violent crimes. But what happens if you're in jail on a misdemeanor, can't make bail? What happens if you're in jail on a contempt of court because you failed to pay child support? What happens if you're in jail because you stole a bag of chips you know, out of the store? or someone's accusing you of breaking into their car, something that is not violent, vulgar, or disheartening, is not murder, is not rape, is not bank robbery. And what happens if you serve your time and you're on parole? The corrections department and the state saw it fit to let you go out into the community so you can become part of the mainstream. You're actually in the mainstream. You've done your time and now you're really engaging in what it's like to be on the outside and rehabilitation, but you don't have full rehabilitation because you can't vote. And now, you know, sometime before we did a show on parole and probation. And so we should understand probation, you're free to vote. If you're on parole, at least as of 2018, there was an issue in the state of New York. But let me just go on. You cannot, you cannot be ruled incompetent by a judge. Um, and you also can, cannot um, claim that you, have, that you live in two different domiciles. You can only live in one domicile, so you can't duplicate your vote. Uh, that's actually a crime. So there's a variety of ways that we have learned, you know, given the pandemic, of how you can go about voting. You know we can vote in person on election day, right? So we all know that. You can vote early in New York as of October 24th, all the way to November 1st. You can do that. Um, always bring your ID and then you can vote by way of mail. And that is the latest that we have seen, right? You need to review, uh, your, you need to complete your, your absentee ballot application. And then you submit the request that you wanna vote by, by mail. And you do exactly that, but you don't put it in necessarily in the post office box. There are designated electoral boxes that you need to put it in so your vote can be so your vote can be counted. I don't want anybody running outside, running to a place and think, oh, I'm just going to drop it in the mail. There are designated places for you to place your vote. Now hey, let me let me just say something before you jump in. What is curious is that the ballots, from what I understand, post supposed to be postmarked by November the 3rd, right? And they can't be received no later than November the 10th. That to me seems like there's a lot of gray for a lot of shenanigans that can go on. Postmarked by the 3rd, can't receive by the 10th. I'm sorry to, inter to interrupt you. Tell me what's on your brain. I mean, listen, just following up real quick on what you just mentioned, um, I read an article, I saw a news flash the other day concerning a Republican Party attempt to commit fraud by placing a fake uh, deposit box for votes for these got to be kidding me. Yes, yes. They, they like set up a box like, yeah, this is a box where you could drop your ballots and it wasn't a real box. I got to follow up on what had what you know what the district attorney in that county is doing in terms of prosecuting the local Republican Party over that shenanigan, or whether they've been even able to determine the exact people that were responsible for the placement. <laughs> what they, what they, what they, what they, when you go low, I go high. I mean, come on now. When you go low, I step on your step on your. <laughs> now, now the other now, now the other thing I wanted to mention is is that. According to election law, section 5104, uh, qualifications of voters, residents gaining or losing, um, it discusses specifically in section one that what you mentioned about you not uh, losing your right to vote if you're like away at college or if you're overseas. Um, but it also, getting to your point about you being in jail, the last part of that says, nor while kept at any welfare institution, asylum, or other institution wholly or partly supported at public expense 
or by charity, nor while confined in any public prison. So I think that last provision, nor while confined in any public prison, uh, contemplates a situation where you're not a felon, but you happen to be um, incarcerated. Um, what how, how, Ed, how does that happen, though, right? How, I mean, do you, how does that, are they giving the guards, are the guards giving out ballots? The guards giving out absentee? How, and, and is it, get, you know, brother. Listen, you, you, you got to be a really bowdy, bowdy cat to be sitting up in some jail and like, well, I want to exercise my right to vote. I want my absentee ballot delivered here to cell 534. So I could go ahead and vote and mail it. I got my stamps and my, yo, man, I, I mean, you know, listen, but, you know, listen, man, if, if there's individuals that, you know, are willing to, you know, get exercise their right to the franchise under those circumstances, but I can just imagine that, I mean, Who's going to be worried about voting when you're sitting in some conf and sitting in confinement doing time, or or whether you know, or how narrow the sleeve is of individuals who are even able to exercise the franchise in that way, and whether you know, like you said, the authorities are going to cooperate in allowing that person to you know exercise their right uh, to vote. Um, the other thing is is that um, I just want to keep folks to keep in mind that. Um, the registration deadline um, did expire on October 9th. So what we're talking more about here is just the basic right to vote and also some of the other, you know, upcoming uh, deadlines. Of course, that November 3rd being election day. But before that, as Royce mentioned, the um, early vote. And just one other thing. Um, some you can my understanding is is that you if you have your absentee ballot um and you don't want to deliver it in person to the polling place and um you're some you become all of a sudden afraid to put it in that mailbox or mail slot or go to the post office you can physically also deliver it to the board of elections Yes, you can. That's okay. right. I and, that. and that will ensure that your vote will uh, count because you because when you're mailing it, basically what you're doing is you're mailing it to the Board of Elections for that ultimate count. You know, my only thing, though, is, is that, man, I, I'm just so afraid that if election night comes and we're relying on taking this guy out based on the counting of the absentee ballots, you know, I'm just afraid of what's going to occur. I mean, you already got all these militias all over the country. You have evidence that members of law enforcement are part of or supportive of these militias. I could see these people doing something really crazy and desperate, especially with what happened last week with the federal government foiling the plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan. Yes, right, right. I'm with you 100%. I mean, it's almost as if, you know, here, here's something for our listeners to understand. For those that have watched this show, this is not a typical show, right? Right now, what we, the topic that we're discussing, our show is not typical in and of itself, but right now what we're discussing, right? Because usually we make sure we take the cultural spin and add it to the legal spin and we make sure that our community is informed. Um, there is a cultural side to this. Um, if you buy into the narrative that uh, majority of the world uh, that are black and brown folks are incarcerated, I don't buy into that, but we need to speak to that because that that, that is an issue. Um, but in anything we do, we wanna talk about it's better to be safe than sorry. So I, put out there to the world and those who listen and those who are afraid to put it in the mailbox, find out where your board of election is and drop it off there. Just find out where it is and just drop it off. One, two, three. I, I think that's a good point to share because this cray cray about a fake box to put ballots, we don't know what's going on with the delivery process moving from the post office to the board of elections. That might be something that folks are more comfortable with, especially those who are volunteering their time to take seniors to the polls. Maybe they can just drive them to drop off at the board of elections. 
so that you can ensure that your vote is being counted because we see what's being set up. The narrative is being created for election night to be very questionable. So we have to be on the offense and not the defense in making sure that we not only exercise our right to vote, but we ensure that those votes get counted. Well, well my, my concern is, is that like, for instance, and let me make clear, my understanding is, and, and, and you know, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, New York is one of those states that doesn't necessarily have those, because um, there are states that have like a box, similar say to a mailbox, Correct. Outdoors Correct. that you can Correct. deposit Correct. the ballot in. That's not New York. What's New Jersey, New Jersey, New Jersey has something like that. And 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 just so folks understand too, because you know when I went to go look at the absentee ballot application, the absentee ballot application is something that's always been in place for people who can't necessarily physically vote, and the part where say people are being encouraged to participate in that way is is that you have to be able to show that you are um that 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 you you have to qualify for that absentee ballot under that health reason but they included that ill temporary illness they included the risk of getting covid the risk, which I don't believe was something that qualified before, the risk of, unless you were able to show that you were like a really immunocompromised individual, I guess, and, you know, credibly, you know, state that. So I don't want folks to get confused and look at the absentee ballot application and say, well, I'm not sick. Am, am I going to be committing fraud? No, no. If you feel like you're at risk of catching it, and that's the reason why you want to vote absentee, you know, you can do that. Because there are some, you know, there, there are some states in terms of the the, 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 the simple mail-in where it's like a choice of simple, I, I wanna I wanna vote by mail versus I wanna vote by uh by by you know physically go and and, and, and lodge uh my vote. You know, here in New York what they're doing is they're filling it within that absentee ballot um uh exception. So just wanted to make that uh, clear to folks. Absolutely, we know we have people tuning in from all over. So just check and see what the policy is. If you can go to the Board of Elections, like you said in New York, it's a little bit differently, but we have to think differently about how we ensure what's happening in the public housing at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue this year. Yeah, and you know what, you know what, and you, brought up, you brought up before and I talked through it briefly, and, and now I guess we can hit it more germanely, is the issue about those who are incarcerated on parole or probation. Now, what we need to understand that it wasn't that long ago that you were prohibited. We're talking about legislative change that took place in New York in 2018, in New Jersey, 2019. So that means before then, you know how many people were ineligible and could not vote. I mean, in New York City, it wasn't an I'll, I'll read it because look, those who claim they know everything really don't know that much. And those that don't know that much, at least are honest enough to know that they don't know and they'll go to a place to find it. So I'm not going to claim that I know everything about election law, but I did my research. And what my research shows me and tells me is that the New York governor executed an order on April 18, 2018 restoring the rights to vote immediately following the re release for most, if not all, New Yorkers that were on parole and that were now and had already served their jail time. And what they would do is that once you were released, um, you would uh, give your pedigree information to the Department of Corrections and su community supervision. And then the governor or his staff or committee or group and once again, we talked about who has those positions early on. We talked about that when we were talking about parole and probation. Is there someone that looks like us, act like us, sound like us, whether Latino, otherwise African-American, otherwise sitting on those boards to say, you know what, this person has served this time, they're back into the community. Now we wanna restore their voting rights. You don't need a court order. You don't need the court to sign something. You don't need any permission. You just need to have a place where someone can track you which might be an issue because sometimes when people are released, they're kind of transient. 
They don't have a place, but if you're so fortunate, then in New York, you can receive what they call that partial pardon, executive pardon, which allows you to have the ability to still register or re-register and then allow you to vote. Compared to New Jersey, where in New Jersey, there is no if, ands, and buts about it. As soon as you've done your time and you're out, you are eligible to vote. And, they, and New Jersey didn't pass that law until 2019. So let me make the point of all points. Let me magnify this. When we look at this in 2018, there was approximately 24,086 people that received this pardon. 24,086 that received this pardon. That's a whole lot of votes. Mm -hmm. And then if you look in New Jersey, when they passed this in 2019, up to 80,000 people were either on parole or probation. Mm -hmm. Now wow. they have the right to vote. That's a lot of people. That's no drop in the bucket. And when you look, yep. at, when you look at states that have followed in line with New Jersey and New York, 17, and, and now you and I, we had this conversation off record, right? Where they should be 50 states, 51 or 52. I like District of Columbia to be, to be 51. You like Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico 52. You like Puerto Rico to be 52, right? You know what I mean? So but if we leave it at 50, 70 out of the 50, which is about 34%, uh, right? And if you do it 50, 52, now you're talking less than 34, you're talking about 30 or 32% of the states have come around to say, look, you did your time, it's done and over with, now you're back into the main street, we're collecting your taxes, we, we, you're around our children, you're around in our community, and we all know voting is a privilege and not a right. So all those who are studying for naturalization, trying to become a citizen, I am not joking. When the INS, Immigration Service Officer, asks you, what are your rights? Don't say voting. Don't say voting. Voting is a privilege. It could be taken away. You know, you have the right to free speech. All right. But voting, you don't have a right to a driver's license. You understand what I'm saying? It's a privilege. So there's a note to my to my folks out there that might be uh, studying to become a naturalized citizen. But when you look at it, that's a small percentage. And when you look at Florida, about 1.4 million people that lived in Florida were felons or transient through Florida and that most recently they you know Florida has come up with a law where you had to pay some fines you had to pay some court fees and then you are allowed to vote I think Ed, maybe they're allowed I don't know it sounds a little funny to me what's going on there well well a few years ago um the Florida legislature did something, you know, monumental where they actually amended the Constitution to allow felons the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the right to vote um, if they had completed their term. Okay. Now, you know, we're lawyers and I understand, you know, we understand that wording is everything. And so apparently do the conservative wording is the only thing. legislature. But what they did is right after the amendment was enacted and went into effect, they said, wait a minute, hold on. We, we got to do something here. We can't just allow this to go down like this. So they said, well, what about those fees and those costs and, and restitution? Isn't that part of the term? And you know, we got to make sure we make that clear. So they passed a law interpreting or, you know, uh, legislatively interpreting that provision of the Constitution term to include court costs, fines, restitution. Now, as, as criminal defense lawyers, Royce, you understand that prosecution takes place on the county level. The yeah, county correct. district attorney is the one that brings criminal charges and otherwise, you know, represents the, the people, if you will, in making sure that whatever conviction that they get against somebody in the sentence that they ultimately get uh, sticks and, 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 you know, ultimately burdens this individual. So what's happening here basically is, is that the Department of State is having an extremely hard time 
determining which felons actually fall within this group of felons that can actually vote because they have to basically set up some system to find out who owes fees, who owes court costs, who owes restitution, and thus can qualify as having completed their term and thus then be able to register. Now, the crazy thing here is that they're saying that some people registered, felon, people that have been convicted of felonies had registered in between that time period of the enactment of the constitutional amendment and then this uh, this law. So some of these people are kind of like, oh snap, what if I vote and then they come after me and say I committed fraud and charge me with a new felony? You know, I don't want to go through that. So that's making a lot of felons in Florida or, or you know, former wait, felons. Wait, 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 wait. Stop, 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 stop right there. Okay. So stop, stop right there. So I want to make sure uh, I'm going to put my Dr. Grant hat on. I want to slow it down. Okay. I want to take it piece by piece because this sounds like the mouse in the maze or me playing Pokemon back in the day and I'm hitting that wall and they get ready to gobble me up, right? So what I'm hearing is, is that, one, I'm going to put a little color to it. There's some brown and black folks that somebody said let them vote if we assume that they are felons. Yeah. They said, let them vote. Mm -hmm. Folks started going to rock and roll. They went, wait a minute. In theory, that sounds good. But in practicality, they're going to run the program. So let's slow it up. Let's make sure that they got to pay some fines and some fees because that's part of what they needed to do anyway, whether it was court course or whether it was restitution, what they call the criminal justice fee. You know, meanwhile, you were smoking marijuana and they gave you a criminal justice fee. You stole a bag of chips and you got a criminal justice court course. They want to make sure that that's part of your term. So you do your 90 days in, you do your 50 years in, you do your 14 years in, and then they want you to pay this 300, 400, maybe a thousand dollars, depending upon interest or whatever. They didn't come out of your commissary, 25 cents, whatever you make during the week while you got your job. That's still outstanding. You don't have a job because you just got out of jail. They give you maybe $400 in the Metro card to keep on moving. But then they saying, hey, look, you got to pay this fee. So they want to slow those folks down. And in between slowing those folks down, before they brought this whole fee thing up, you got guys out there that's already eligible to vote. And now they hear about this fee thing. And they're like, yo, you know what? I'm not going to vote. Because if I do, then I'll have the FBI at my door again saying, hey, man, you didn't pay your fees, so therefore you committed a crime. And you're talking about, well, wasn't I grandfathered in? Because I registered before they came out with that amendment. And nobody's speaking to the grandfather in. Nobody's saying anything in Florida like this group is exempt. They're just talking. And, 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 the, and, the, and the agency that would be in charge of determining which felons are eligible and which ones are not of course, they ask for more money because they need more workers and more staff to be able to go through this exhaustive exercise. And of course, I don't think they've gotten the funding as of yet. And I don't think they will before November 3rd. And now uh, yeah, 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 yeah. think of, of the those who run Florida, I believe it has a Republican governor, uh, you know. And uh, plus the policing, the policing of it is just a nightmare. How do you police? Do you go to county court? Like in New Jersey, in New Jersey, you have counties. So every county, so you go on what? Passaic County, Bergen County. It's not like New York where it's Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens. You could just go to Bronx and who didn't file fees. You got counties. No, no, yeah. you got you also got boroughs. You got boroughs. Villages. You got hamlets. Oh man. You got yeah. villages. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Go. Like how many how many people would be eligible to vote? They really don't want them to vote. They have this backdoor situation that if you didn't pay your fees, then it's another problem. So they can't vote. So what are we really doing? And, 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 and listen, let me also mention something relating it back to New York. You mentioned earlier an executive order. Executive orders are fine while that governor is the executive. You know, uh, just, yeah. just so you understand, yeah. the governor is considered the executive, because that's the executive branch of New York state government, right? You got the legislative, you got the executive, you got the judicial. Mm -hmm. 
executive order is a power that's exercised by the governor, that governor. Let's say he leaves the governor's seat and goes on to become, they're talking about Cuomo becoming the US AG, the United States Attorney General if Biden gets elected, right? So he leaves office. Let's say he's replaced by a Republican governor. That Republican governor doesn't have to enforce or he, it, those executive orders don't apply at that point is what I'm trying to say. And that's why, you know, when you hear about executive orders, you got to say, hmm, why can't we just pass a law and put it on the books? Okay. Mm, you know, that, that survives any administration, unless of course the legislature repeals that law or amends it, it's on the books, no matter who the governor is. So when we're talking about Cuomo and these immediate or pardons, let's be careful because the reality of it is the law is for that part of the law in terms of voter registration, it says no person who has been co convicted of a felony pursuant to the laws of this state shall have the right to register for or vote at any election unless he shall have been pardoned or restored to the rights of citizenship by the governor or his maximum sentence of imprisonment has expired or he has been discharged from parole. The governor, however, may attach as a condition to any such pardon a provision that any such person shall not have the right of suffrage until it shall have been separately restored to him. What that means at the end, you know, I'd, I'd have to kind of do some shepherdizing or what we call kind of looking at what cases have applied mm -hmm. that provision of law, what courts have interpreted that. But it sounds to me like, you know, you know, once governor, once the governor is, is, is gone, you know, um, you know, we're, 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 we're back to this idea of looking at whether that maximum sentence of imprisonment has expired. Yep. Whether you have actually been discharged from parole. Well, I can tell you, look, the law is there. The law is black and white. And you say it looks like to you. It don't look like to you. It is. If Como steps down or steps up or steps to the side, someone else can come in and do away with that executive order. Now, in New York, highly unlikely, Democratic state, probably not, but... Yeah, we had Pataki, we, we right, had right. Yes. You know, yes. we had... Yes. I mean, I mean, listen, you're probably right because the way the trend has been going, you know, the Republicans seem to really have lost power in the state of New York, but, man, you never know, you know, it's, it's like, you know, people get scared, they become conservative, and they start voting for the folks who they feel are gonna make them feel safe, you know, and. Especially, especially when now you have, you know, you have crime on the uptick mm. in the city and all of a sudden you have, uh, what's the group, Guardian Angels? They dusting off their suit, dust off their red hats. You know, they out there doing the do. You know, I had to tell some of my frat brothers, watch out, you know, don't get mixed up in that red and white out there, you know, yeah. right? And you if know, you don't know martial arts, oh man, my man Curtis Sliwa might, Chop you, oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, you, know, but, you know what? Let's get back to this. I'll finish your point, Mr. Lovell. No, 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 no. I was going to transition because we were talking about power, <laughs> and we know that, uh, you know, we having these confirmation hearings, and that's all about power. But I want you to finish your point. Yeah, it's, it's just a reminder that, once again, in every state, we are dealing with a variety of cultural issues when it comes to all of the topics that we discussed. But with voting, I just want to go back to something that both of you mentioned, and we kind of moved past it. Even if they have the right to vote, there's still steps that they need to take to vote. So oh, yeah, without a question. Right to vote. Yeah. And they're like afraid of something else coming up, so they're not going to vote. So I just want to close this discussion with what would you tell your clients? if they were in that position and now they have the right to vote? I would say vote for two reasons. One, resources spent to try to figure out where you fall in the group is resources that in a variety of states will not be used. And if they are, I think you have a defensible case in the gap space in Florida, number one. Two, 
I mean, if you're talking about New York and New Jersey, you're free to do what you what you need to do. But in Florida, in particular, you know, there is that gap space there. And three, if the law hasn't fully been flushed out in the way that a lay person can understand it, and it hasn't been certified, voted on, then it is just theory. It's theory. Now, and you might differ, but I say go for it. I mean, you know, it's 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 kind of tough you know, advising clients under these circumstances, because one of the things I was thinking, well, let's say the client comes up and says to you, well, listen, I want to vote. And you ask them, well, do you still owe any fees, any court costs, anything? Have you completed that? Well, you know, to the best of my knowledge, I have. And you say to the person, well, you know what, as just a safety precaution, why don't you go down to the county clerk and have them pull the file and you know, make sure that you don't have any outstanding obligations. Are you poking the bear at that point and bringing attention to a fee that otherwise they weren't trying to collect from you? Um, you know, what happens under those circumstances? Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's tough. And I think just the practical effect is going to be very few people are going to be bold enough or care enough after having you know, going through the experience of a criminal prosecution for a felony, no less, to test the waters in that in that fashion. I mean, um, you know, even when I was uh, doing voter registration back in the day um, during uh, Bush Gore, I was sitting outside of supermarkets in Milwaukee in black neighborhoods, telling guys that look, listen, oh, what you were a convicted felon if you completed all the terms and conditions of your, you know, probation or parole, you'll no longer have to report, then you should be able to vote. Even then, some of those individuals were like, man, I don't know. I don't know. You know, it was still extremely reluctant to go ahead and exercise the franchise. Um, I want to, yeah, so, so you know, I mean, it's, it's just tough. I think you know, this is where legal minds kind of differ, you know, because I agree. I mean, the resources to be spent on trying to figure out whether or not somebody was qualified to vote and then charging them with fraud are pretty extreme. But, you know, in some of these conservative states and counties where, you know, um, certain people are in power and they're going full blast. I mean, listen, back in the day during uh, Bush v. Gore, you know, there was proof later on that the uh the 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 um the head of the department of state in florida actually purged people from the voter rolls meaning they removed them from the voter rolls actively by either saying oh well you know you you haven't voted in a while or your registration is old, or we found out that you're a felony you're not even supposed to be on the voter rolls and removing you i don't even think they did an investigation as to whether or not these people had completed the, you know, I mean, I think at that time it was before the amendment, so felons period couldn't vote, so they were removing them off the rolls. So, you know, it depends on who's in power and where they choose to allocate their resources and time, quite frankly. Well, I think, I think, I think this, is one, this is one of those times where I think you're correct in that you have to be careful. I think there's a difference between being a public official and being a citizen. And, and we all know that we have to if you're prosecuting someone, you have to show that one element intent, right? Intent to the fraud. No, my intent was to vote. Yeah. Uh, you know, the laws are conflicting. Um, there's ambiguity. Um, there's, uh, there's indecisiveness. There is no black letter of the law. So what I know is what I went with. And like I said, the resources being spent in the time of COVID um, before I fetched to, to, to utilize it in that way. Yeah. But as you say, power is power. And, and what I was going to transition to, Dr. Grant, is that when we have these confirmations, Supreme Court confirmations hearing, you know that's all about power. And so we have Amy, what is it, Amy Cooney? Barrett? Amy Coney Barrett. Coney? Coney? Yeah. Oh, I, got a, I, got a, I got a problem. Yeah, with, so, I got a problem with Coney in and of itself. Like that name right there, like, like you know. Like, wait, hold on, hold on. Before we get over to talking about her, I really just want to close out the fact that there might be some organizations that help felons when it comes to or or past felons that when it comes to voting. And if there aren't enough, then that's an opportunity, right? That we get 
organizations to really help walk through the fact that if you owe certain fees, like just really helping to educate those who are trying to reacclimate to society and to life, that they have the support that they need so they can participate in our system. And voting is a big part of that. I mean, that's thousands of votes. That could shift an election if we really activate those individuals who might want to, but they're scared to all the issues that you raise and how you would advise your clients. But I just want to close out that discussion with sharing information with organizations that might have the capacity to help an ex-felon be able to exercise their right to vote. This is one major election, but we have multiple elections coming up. And as they get back into gaining their sea legs, right, doing the things that they need to do in society, voting is a part of it. So we need to find more organizations and groups and get more started that can give that kind of support. So yes, we will transfer now on to the power conversation with Mr. Russell's favorite person in the news right now. <laughs> well, I don't know if she's my favorite person, but I can tell you what, uh, she's doing a good job from what I'm seeing, uh, playing her role. Um, for those that don't know, you know, I practice in the area of immigration. And one of the uh, questions that I often see on what we call adjustment of status applications, that's when you're trying to become a legal permanent resident, right? So you're here, you either have a work authorization, someone sponsoring you for work, or you married a U.S. citizen or have a loved one that is sponsoring you to become a U.S. citizen. And so you have to fill out this application called adjustment of status. And I'm gonna take a long route to a shortcut. The reason why I bring it up is that on this application, some of the questions that they ask you, you have to be an idiot to put down an answer that was in the affirmative, such as, are there any, any acts that you've committed that you have not been arrested for or cited for since you've been in the United States? Now, what person is going to put down yes when they're trying to become a legal permanent resident? Yeah, there's a couple of things I did that were criminally related that I wasn't arrested for. And so, yeah, I'm going to put that down on the application. Have you ever participated in polygamy or prostitution? You think I'm going to put down yes on an application where I'm trying to become a U.S. citizen that I participate in polygamy and, prosti and prostitution? No, you're not. So let's look at Amy. Let's look at the judge, Judge Amy, Judge Barrett. You think she's going to say anything that's going to create an opportunity that she doesn't get confirmed in the shortest window as possible? She's going to dress all those black kids up as nice as they want to be and make sure that they photo perfect behind her. She is not going to say anything that is going to tilt the cart one way or the other. First, she has, she's a woman. She's a white woman. She has the family dynamic going on in that she, I believe both of her kids who are of color is from Haiti or Haitian based. Um, she has one boy, one female, one girl. So she could speak to Black Lives Matter in a very limited way as to what she fears in the future. So therefore some folks can hold on to the little thin shred that she might rule in our on our behalf in some quake of a Supreme Court case. Uh, she has a black daughter and she has a daughter in and of herself. And she, I think of one of her daughters, she had one white, one black. So Roe v. Wade and, and she is, you know, a, a religious. And so, you know, religious versus job, where do we stand in that? And so what has she done? She has done the best that she could and the best that she could was to quote notorious RBG. I mean, that's a smart move right there. You come at me and I'm just gonna quote the person that I'm replacing, the notorious RBG. So you come at me and I just do the Ginsburg rule. I just say, hey, look, no hints, no previews and no forecasts to any of these issues that's gonna be brought before me. I mean, that's, that's a power play. That's, you can't even crack that. Well, you know, I mean, the Democrats have been, you know, trying to, you know, uh, crack the veil and get her to say something that um, will, you know, possibly sink her nomination. But she's been, you know, from the little bit that I've watched, she's been hanging in there pretty tough, you know, not really, you know, showing her cards um, at all. I mean, the bottom line here, this is an exercise of power. Um, 
she's given every indication that um, she's going to serve as the bulwark of the uh, conservatives uh, on this court. You know, she she actually worked at a law at the law firm that represented Bush during Bush v. Gore. Just so you understand that, you know, after she got out of law school, that was one of the jobs that she had at this uh, private law firm, I believe, after she clerked for Scalia. You know, she was a clerk for Justice, uh, you know, now D.C. Scalia, who was extremely uh, conservative. So, you know, that's something to look at here. And um, she was uh, placed on the Court of Appeals by Donald Trump in 2017 on the Seventh Circuit. Now, for those that you, I mean, I think on the earlier shows, we talked about circuit courts of appeal. That's the appellate branch of the federal court. That's the court that decides a case before it goes to the Supreme Court. That's if the Supreme Court decides to hear it, if they grant cert. So she's on the Seventh Circuit, which sir, she was, she is, because until she gets nominated, she's still a judge on the Seventh Circuit. It serves Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. That is considered one of the most conservative circuit courts actually in the country. Um, you know, Midwest, um, you know, there's a pretty good uh, synopsis of some of the decisions that major cases that she's uh, participated in out of that circuit on a Wikipedia page. I would welcome people to look at um, and delve deeper into some of the cases that she decided um, you know, I, I know that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund isn't happy with her uh, based on, you know, uh, an EEOC case that was brought against AutoZone having to do with their placement of employees based on their race at different locations and neighborhoods, which say were majority African-American, they placed them there, majority Hispanic, they placed them there. Some people are arguing that the decision by the Seventh Circuit had taken place before she actually got on the Seventh Circuit, but that she saw participated in a later decision impacting that case. In either case, some people are concerned about, you know, uh, that. And then there was, I guess, another case regarding a black employee who sued after he was called a uh, stupid N-I-G-G-R and her deciding that, you know, his discharge had nothing to do with that, but instead his poor performance. Well, you know, that, was, that, that, would, have been, that would have been an uphill battle no matter what judge that case was before. Words alone does not create a hostile work environment, but I hear what you're saying. But just in particular, I'm not for her. I'm not advocating for her. What I'm advocating, advocating is that when you look at what she is saying, it's almost impossible to penetrate what the inevitable will be, therefore highlighting our responsibility to make sure we vote. She said something she wrote in one of her uh, decisions, and I'll read it. She said, allegedly, she said, let me put allegedly, she wrote, president, and so what president is for, for those that are watching and listening, is that, uh, the rule, the standard, right? The standard is, is I open up the door for women, women walk through, they say, thank you, I say, welcome. That's the standard, that's there. That's been embedded in our history, right? And that's what we look to, right? So that's that's what we call precedent, right? So well, we're also talking about prior case law. Right? And we're talking, so in, that, in, the, in the world of law, we're talking about prior case law. It is the standard, it is what you look to, to say, this is what we should do in the future. When we see this again, when we see the guy hit a ground ball in the first, we should tag the guy out at first and throw him out at second, not throw it at second and wait for the ball to come back for baseball fans, right? So what she said is that president matters less, if at all. So she's saying president matters less, if at all, if the arguments are convincing that president clashes. Now, at first when I read that. It matter if at all? Right. Now, when I first read that, I was like, whoa. Wow. Wait a minute. She's off the chain. But then 
And when I read it again, without the context of the case that she was talking about, I was like, well, she may have something here because what we did before, if it clashes with what we're doing now in time and space, do we really have to adhere to what we did before? It is a very interesting question. I'm not saying she's right, I'm not saying she's wrong, but it is a very interesting question. Because the standard was you had to have three apples and an orange in order to get past go. And now you're in a place in time where there's more apples being picked than oranges and you can't find one. Does that mean we stop here? So, you know, as the Democrats are trying to beat her with her own language, I'm saying to myself, wow, she is like pretty protected. And let me just say one other thing. She speaks to, she says, the best way to have social change is through new legislation rather than in the interpretation of the Constitution. So if you want social change, then you need to have new legislation versus trying to reinterpret the Constitution. And Ed, before you bite it off, because I see you ready, let me add one more thing so you can have enough to chew on in the last nine minutes. They call her, they call her a, an originalist, right? So for those out there, let me tell you what an originalist is in layperson terms. All right. That's a person that interprets the Constitution as law. That she, in, she doesn't interpret it as text. She interprets it as law. And it's her understanding that it has meaning that was appropriate for that time. And so therefore, there is no change in the Constitution over time with your own interpretation and your own infusion of thought. The Constitution is what it is. You have to change policy and through legislation. And, 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 that's, and, that's, and that's always been problematic for me because I've actually found that whole originalism argument and, you know, to, to be very uh, contradictory. I, I remember, I, I can't cite the case, but I remember reading one case where Scalia wrote the majority opinion. And in that, I think, case, he came up with some argument that, you know, the Constitution is an evolving document. Well, aren't you an originalist? I mean, isn't yeah, that it can't be evolved. a contradiction? A, a contradiction? Yeah. Aren't you saying that the Constitution has to be plainly read or otherwise amended by the legislature, which, by the way, is extremely hard? I believe you have to do two constitutional conventions with some sort of overwhelming majority to it'll then. Never be, it'll never get done. It'll you know, never add, um, amendments, you know. Um, so, you know, very, very difficult. Uh, to do. And by the way, the, the majority of the founding fathers who authored that document were slave owners and all men. You know what I mean? Right. So, so, you know, I mean, to, 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 to you know. But, is, it, but, Ed, is, it, but Ed, is there something is there something to be said for the fact that the founding fathers was all white, all slave owners, all men, that to a degree we, did, we should discard it in making certain decisions in the future well well, well you know I, I mean i wouldn't go i'm, I'm sorry I, I just wouldn't go that far i mean i wouldn't say that it needs to be abolished um altogether but i feel like um you know courts my philosophy is is that courts should take into account present day circumstances um should look at societal wrongs historical wrongs and understand that you know, there are certain principles in the document that justify an evolution in the law. I mean, because, you know, some of that stuff, when you read it too plain, um, talks about a time period that no longer conforms with the way we live um, at present. Like, for instance, um, I believe the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms, you know, when that was written, my understanding was it was written during a period where we had just freed ourselves from, you know, uh, England, you know, as a as a colony. You know, we had these militias and, and 
and so forth, and, and people were concerned about, you know, uh, people being able to protect their immediate communities and so forth before you had the evolution of the law and law enforcement and the growth of the society. You know, so, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if we're too far from that because I, mean, I still want to protect my community given what I see out of the NYPD. Oh, and I, I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, yeah, you know, it, makes, it makes for an interesting discourse because unless you are a person of color and i hear you 100 percent i you know i'm not being facetious i'm not trying to be antagonistic i hear exactly what you're saying you don't want to safeguard that with someone that hasn't walked in your shoes right because it gets a little fugazi when you do that right but it is a very interesting argument that says look i look at that document that document is what it is I, i'm not going to abolish it i'm not going to set it on fire but if you want something new don't have me interpret with some white men in a room that own slaves. Don't have me interpret that and try to transplant that to what's in the future. And the only reason why I'm bringing this up is that this this judge is savvy. She, I mean, it, well, well, she, was, she, was, she was a savvy. law professor for most of her career. She, I think she spent two years at that law firm after spending a few years as a clerk. And then she went on to, you know, become a law professor. And she was a law professor up until 2017, a few years ago, when Trump put her on the Court of Appeals. I think has about maybe 78 decisions that she's participated in throughout these uh, two some odd years that she's been on the bench. So, um, you know, intellectually, you know, because for you to become a, a law professor, you know, you got to have, you know, you got to be pretty weighty there on the on the on the on the uh, intellectual uh, scale, um, but also it also doesn't give the Democrats much to go on in terms of decisions. They, the best right. thing they have to do is review her publications or her law review articles, uh, speeches, and stuff like that. You know, they've been attacking her some on some of her um, Catholic oriented slash conservative uh, views. Um, some of her um, outlooks on 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 voting protection and so forth but, but I don't know the truth. yeah so here's the thing Ed Royce we talked about this a couple of times backtrack to how we started the show talking about the importance of voting what's happening we particularly focused on the felons he appointed her key it's not just the election of who sits in 1600 Pennsylvania, but what they're able to do when they're in office. So there are a lot of appointments. She's one of many that were appointed as judges and other- 128, 128, 128 to, be. to be exact. And so, Kamala Harris talked about in the debate with Pence last week about how I don't think any of those appointments have been uh, black uh, black men, right? Uh, black males at all. Mm -hmm. uh, those judges that have been appointed throughout these last uh, four years. Elections have consequences. The Republicans actively prevented um, Obama during his two terms from from mm -hmm. seating a lot of judges of his choice on you know district courts, courts of appeals. Not to mention Merrick Garland at the end on the Supreme Court after Scalia had passed away. So, but the question, becomes, the question becomes when I hear you say that, and I hear Dr. Grant say what she has said as far as important. Why are the Democrats, and this is not a political show, this is legally speaking, cultural, legal, mixed in minds, but we're on this platform right now. Why are they always getting punched in the face? I mean, like, I don't understand it. You have 128 vacancies, you can't get one in. You can't get a Supreme Court judge in. This guy comes up, he gets his 128. He's gonna pass this one through, and like, well, that 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 speaks to what you're supposed to do when you have a majority in the Congress. If you yeah. have the Senate and you have the House, but you know, if you have the Senate, they do nominations, appointments. They you know they confirm rather they confirm. So it's important that that branch of the legislature get captured by the Democrats and that a Democratic president gets elected so that, you know, the appointments can can start rolling, you know? Absolutely. Because well, well, the Republicans, when they get the opportunity, they stack, they do what they need to do. They stack, they don't make any excuses for it. 
the it's funny how the narratives have switched from Obama trying to do the same thing that Trump is doing. So we know that our show gets packed with a lot of information and we're at the top of the hour. But the important thing is we can't give up on voting. We still have to vote. We still have to make sure that we do the things we need to do culturally so that we can shift what is happening in our representation. 128 judges, that should say something. Some people stayed home in the last election. They were like, oh, I can't be bothered. Lesser of two evils. We can't go through those arguments again. We have to effectuate change. So speaking legally, where the legal meets the cultural, Thank you both, Royce Russell Esquire, Edward Pichardo Esquire. We appreciate all of you showing up. Hey, Jason. Hey, Jose. Hey, Michelle. We appreciate you coming to the show. I'm Deborah, Richard, uh, all of you that are here each and every week. Today, our topic was focused on some of the things that we just need to be aware of so you can have more intelligent conversations when we're having those hairdresser, barbershop, sidewalk conversations where you think you're an attorney, but you're hearing it from two attorneys who do this and advocate for us every day. So gentlemen, you want to say any final words before we close our show? Adios, sayonara. <laughs> and, you know, farewell. Thank you for listening to our show today. As I stated at the beginning, I hope you found it informative. I believe you did, you know, um, and, you know, uh, take care. Right. How about the Lakers? How about oh, the Lakers, bro? On the Lakers. How about, you know, hey, my shirt says, all good. All right, all good. this is all where good. the show has to all end. Good. Start <laughs> there you go. It's all good. good to see you. Thank you all once again for tuning in. We'll be back next week, Speaking Legally, every Wednesday, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's Dr. Stacy signing off. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care.